for the world to find out a little bit more about this research and to really identify what works and what doesn't work. It is my privilege to be here representing the many colleagues that we work in, not only in Sierra Leone, but around the world, and the efforts that go to identify um, how to excel uh, under very difficult uh, conditions. And I thank you for giving us that um, introduction about Sierra Leone and a little bit of a historical background. Um, we know that elections are both an opportunity for envisioning a new future, uh, a, to have dialogue on new policies, um, and also they are quite uh, a point in a country, in any country, where the situations are sometimes fragile, particularly around new democracies, where uh, special interests are sometimes threatened, where um, electoral systems uh, need to be strengthened, um, today, uh, we are going to be talking about one of the many projects in which Search for Common Ground implements, not only in Africa, but also in Asia and Middle East, uh, and uh, going in a deep dive into some of our activities. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to talk a little bit about Search for Common Ground's approach during elections and good governance. And we have a three-pillar approach, and I want to stress that um, Every country is different, and uh, every situation and every election is different. So we have to be adapted to the local context, and our strategy is uh, created by our, our country staff uh, and through their leadership. But essentially, it's really around three pillars. The first pillar is around building the partnerships to build the right electoral infrastructure, whether we are working with civil society or across uh, political parties to really bring together a coalition that can build better systems. And in 2008, a Search for Common Ground chair the National Elections Watch, also known as MU, which was a coalition of CSOs dedicated to election observation and working in memberships to make sure that over 5,000 polling stations had improved safety um, and, and um, yeah, safety and, and fraud fraud was taking through. But in 2012, and I think what we're most proud of is, is that Search for Common Ground took more of a backstage role and we gave that chairship back to the CSOs for them to manage their own election process. And I think that speaks volume of the work that Search for Common Ground does, the ability to you know identify where there's a spot and where we need to work, but also take uh, a sidestep and making sure that our partners, strategic partners, uh, feel supported as they take on the leadership and work towards making sure that they take ownership over their own electoral processes. The second pillar of our work is around media synergy. And this is something that we do in most of the countries that we work in, where we work with journalists and the media sector, make sure that they have the capacities to report on elections impartially. And one of our core programs has been around journalist exchanges. So where we take uh, journalists from say government uh, affiliated media and independent media to work together and report on elections together in order to have a shared dialogue around what is the narrative nationally. And just uh, a couple of weeks ago in Nigeria, we did a very successful project where we had journalists from the north uh, reporting from the South and vice versa in order for there to be uh, a different narrative in your news. And so all of a sudden you were not just hearing from your favorite uh, radio announcer on your favorite journalist on TV, but they were actually reporting from somewhere else and were able to validate that yes, it was peaceful and yes, this is how uh, the news was being uh, followed locally. Um, and the third pillar of our work, which is one of what we're going to be talking about today, is really about what information do citizens need in order to make informed decisions around the election process and around uh, the candidates. And here we do several of activities, 
most of them again around media. So we have a lot of production on radio and local languages through different uh, means. So either jingles and calling radio shows or soap operas where characters have to engage in the elections. Uh, and one of the activities that we do that Rachel is going to go a little bit more in depth is that we also organize uh, town halls and debates. And these debates are sometimes videotaped, and we take the videotapes of the debates into rural and isolated communities where often information, there's a gap of information about, about both the election, but also the, um, the uh, national process and who their candidates are. And so, um, Today, it's, it's really, we're going to go a deep dive. And most of everyone who's ever sat on a panel in Washington, D.C. is always dreads Q&A because they always get asked the question, this sounds all wonderful, but does it work? And everyone asks the question, what evidence do you have? Do you evaluate it? And what is your learning strategy? Well, as a monitoring and evaluation specialist and a self-proclaimed data you know, enthusiast, that's my favorite question. And I think that if we're not being accountable to ourselves and learning ourselves, but also sharing that widely, um, we're, we're disservicing the good work of our colleagues and the people that we work for and with. So I'm very proud to be here at Search for Common Ground, where we do have very strong uh, roots in, in learning and accountability where all our evaluations are um, externally, so you can find them in our website. And I always say both good and bad, not in terms of good or badly written, but you know everything in between is there for you to engage with, engage with the data, ask questions, and for us to learn together. And uh, here at Search for Common Ground, we work with many uh, different partnerships, uh, and also we explore many kinds of different types of evaluations. So in, for instance, right now in Liberia, we're using outcome mapping to, and, and progress markers to really assess whether the strengthening capacity of CSOs is working or not. And they themselves have set their own benchmarks towards what a success look like. In 2008, another partnership uh, that was worked very well is with the University of Pennsylvania, in which we have worked with them to assess our radio and media work. And they put together a mixed methodology approach uh, that we follow through and carry forward uh, so that we can compare where we have been successful and where we have not been successful with their media work. So in 2011, 2012, when Jay Paul came to us and say, can we partner? Uh, are you open to having uh, an impact evaluation and using uh, these methods to better understand uh, civic education? Uh, we, of course, said yes, and let's make sure we do it in a conflict sensitive way. And that is the right methodology for us. But we are so pleased that um, this partnership worked so well. Uh, at times, we had to operate very rapidly under um, you know, very difficult situations, mostly just to get the logistics right to, to get more knowledge. Um, but um, today, you're going to hear a little bit about whether debates really increase political knowledge, whether they lead to informed voting, and whether it's political alignment or not. And I think those are all questions that we should be asking so that we not only know whether we do what we're doing is effective, but also where should we invest, where programs should be scaled and which ones shouldn't, and that we better understand uh, the work that we do on an effective manner. So that's my short intro. I'm going to leave Rachel to do all the hard work of presenting <laughs> these data, and we definitely have time for a Q&A, so back. Back to you and presenting uh, Rachel, and thank you once again for being here with us. I know, no, you got You want me to go ahead and present yes. Rachel? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Rachel Glenister is Executive Director of the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, JFAL. Our research includes random evaluation of community-driven development, the adoption of new agricultural technologies, and improving the accountability of politicians in Sierra Leone. 
empowerment of adolescent girls in Bangladesh and health governance, education, and microfinance programs in India. She serves as scientific director for JPAL Africa, co-chair of JPAL's agricultural program, and is board member of the Agricultural, agricultural Technology Adoption Initiative. She is lead academic, academic for Sierra Leone, whoa, for the International Growth Center. Between 2007 and 2010, she served on the UK Department of International Development, DFIT's Independent Advisory Committee on Development Impact. Rachel Galister helped establish the warm the world. Okay, thanks. Um, slides up. Yeah. You might need to switch on that. Oh, yeah. Okay, I feel better standing up anyway. So, um, so thanks for the introduction and thanks, Vanessa, and Search for what has been an amazing partnership. Um, so, I want to start with. Um, where at least I started on this project, which was thinking that despite a big increase in the number of countries who uh, are, have democratically elected uh, parliaments and, and executives, uh, there's kind of been a bit of a disappointment about, I feel, in the development sector about what democracy has delivered. You know, we still have corruption, um, election debate is often not based on policy, and and I also feel like a lot of the programmatic work in this area is kind of getting people to vote and telling them the day of the election. Uh, and it's not necessarily always addressing um, these issues. Um, and you know, a lot of accountability work that I, you know, I've just come from the World Bank, a lot of their work on accountability kind of ignores politicians that are trying to get the, the community involved in, in supporting uh, you know, getting better schools directly, but it sort of ignores the fact that we have politicians and democracy, and you know that's meant to be an important lever of accountability. So, having done various evaluations of community mobilisation that ignores politicians, I kind of felt it was time to go back to the roots of, of, uh, of you know, what, which is why we came to search for common ground and can we can we improve the democratic process. So, as I say, kind of the first generation of democracy programs are about setting up the system, so which are really important. You've got to have electoral commissions that are fair, you've got to have voter IDs so that you know, there isn't corruption in that system. But what's next? Right? We've sort of done a lot of that in a lot of countries, and that's been really important, but it doesn't get us everywhere we want to go. So the question we came to search with is, can we, you know, does engaging voters more in the political process lead to you know more informed voters and uh, potentially change MP behavior. So this was very much a collaboration between Search for Common Ground, Innovations for Property Action, uh, which is a research organization with a big office in uh, in Sierra Leone and and JPAL, the, the group that I'm part of. And, and the work was funded by the IGC, which is funded by DFID, and JPAL Governance Initiative, which is funded by Hewitt um, and DFID. So thanks to them. Uh, so, so I just in other countries we've learned that providing specific information to voters can change the way they vote. So there are many studies out there, but one example is in Brazil, where they did an audit of uh, of local governments and randomly picked which ones they would focus on first, and therefore the results came up before the election and others they, they worked on later and the results came out after the election. But the ones in in the in the areas where the, the audit results came out before the election, you see a very, uh, you know, a big effect on how people are voting. So people are, are deciding not to vote for people that they hear are corrupt. Interestingly, only in the areas where there's local uh, radio programs who can tell people about the results of these, of these findings. Um, but well, that's kind of interesting. You, if you work somewhere like Syria, there aren't national audits of local government. There aren't. There isn't a lot of kind of specific information about MP behaviour that you can give to voters. So, what do you do? What do you do in that kind of environment? Um, a lot of campaigns have told voters about how 
constituency facilitation funds, or many countries have these funds that MPs have are given to spend locally. And so again, a lot of often those are audited, and so people have done programs to disseminate to communities how that money has been spent. But in Sierra Leone, there is a constituency facilitation fund, but MPs aren't accountable for it. Nobody checks how it's spent. It goes into their bank account and they're not required to provide receipts. So what do you, you know, what do you disseminate in a really information poor uh, community? Well, uh, Leda Wanchcott and, and different and various co-authors on different projects have done some really interesting work in Benin in the Philippines, looking at kind of engagement between politicians and voters. And they found in one case they had council meetings. It was just with one party. So one he persuaded one party to randomly pick where they were going to do town hall meetings and found that these um, in, you know more kind of dialogue between the politicians and, and voters increased voter knowledge and turnout and support for the candidates. Um, so we, you know, that was part of informing of, you know, the design of this process, which we did collaboratively. But, but just to come back to Sierra Leone, again, you know, we're working in a very information poor environment. Data that we collected in, in exit polls show that in the areas that we're working, which is rural Sierra Leone, 70% of the sample had no schooling, never walked inside a school, 31% uh, had no radio, 64% couldn't name a single responsibility of an MP, they didn't know what MPs did, um, and only 28% could name uh, any of the candidates. So so that's kind of the, the background. Here's another bit of background about Sierra Leone. On the left, you will see the ethnic composition, and I've simplified it by saying anything in green is a constituency has greater than 30% Mende. So the two biggest ethnicities are Mende and Kimni. So, uh, and in the north, we see uh, a lot of constituencies with more than 30% of voters are Timni. And then if you look on the right, you'll see the voting patterns. And you'll see they correlate very, very closely. So this was actually the previous election before 2012. Um, and you'll see that you know, the SLPP gets, wins all of the constituencies that are more than 30% uh, Mende, and the APC wins nearly all the constituencies that are um, greater than 30% Mende. So you get this real kind of ethnic based voting. Um, so in that environment, what did we, uh, what, what, what did we work with? Um, what could we evaluate that search did. So search hosted debates uh, between members of parliament. So Sierra Leone is a country with 112 single member constituencies first past the post. Uh, and the two main parties, as I've said, are the APC and the SLPP. So there's, there was a splinter group that split, split off from the SLPP, which is, you know, also was an end party, which uh, did well in the previous election, but by 2012 wasn't doing um, wasn't as important. Um, now we knew from the previous election that voters knew much more about their local candidates, so candidates for the council election, than they knew about MPs. They knew, knew very little about them, their member of parliament. Um, they didn't know their name. They were much more likely to know the name of the local councillor. And and. My colleague uh, Kate Casey for her PhD thesis showed that that there's much more cross-ethnic voting in the local council elections than there are national elections, which raises the question of are people voting ethnically just because they don't have any other information? Right? If they don't know anything about the candidate, why not vote on the basis of ethnicity? Because you know I don't have anything else to go. So whereas you know, or is it like this very deeply held um, question? So. So what we what we work with search to do is pick so there are twenty eight constit we pick twenty eight of the most con highly contested constituencies um, and randomly picked fourteen of those and then offered the candidates in those places the chance to debate each other and so 
I think all but one candidate agreed to debate, which was fantastic because you know we only found out at the end of September who the candidates were, and the election was in the beginning of November. So it was very. Uh, but the parties, the main parties we've been talking to for a long time, and they supported the idea. So, so these debates were held, and they were videotaped. They were moderated by Search's um, awesome. Uh, radio personality that people actually know from the, from the radio. Um, and they, uh, uh, and then, and then as, as Vanessa was talking about, we took that on the road. So they took screens or a generator and the ability to, to project. Usually it was projected onto the wall of a, you know, a building in the village, so often the school building. It was usually the polling station. So all 224 polling stations in these communities, we randomly picked 112 to, uh, to have the screening. And then search, you know, often they were like lugging generators up, you know, by hand up cars uh, to get them to these very rural uh, areas. But they were a great hit. So 19,000 people actually watched one of these screenings. And the debates, had a lot of local questions, but they also had a few common features. So there were a bunch of getting to know you questions. So, you know, what's your education? Where did you grow up? What are your hobbies? And you'll understand why in a bit, <laughs> why, we are, why we did that. What's the first priority for government spending? So this was trying to get the debate onto issues. You know, let's talk about what, you know, priorities and issues and political issues. Constituency facilitation fund. You can't hold an MP accountable for spending that money if you don't know how much it is. So some of the questions were, so the moderator explained to the audience how much money was given to MPs every year to spend in the constituency. And then the candidates were asked, how will you spend this money if you get elected? So it was an attempt to kind of put them on record. Um, strategy to uplift the youth, any of you who know Sierra Leone know how important the question of, uh, of youth and their conflict with elders was in the Civil War. Um, positional and gender equity bill. This was a bill people had really different views about. And so this was quote, quotas for women in parliament. So do you support having quotas for women in parliament? And, and then the last one, free healthcare implementation. This was a big signature issue of the incumbent government. So it was a big thing that they didn't produce. And so the parties were kind of arguing about how good it was. Um, this is a debate. So you can see um, people dressed in the colors of their party, SLPP candidate, APC candidate, the moderator asking questions, and PMBC uh, candidate at the end. This was not every constituency had three main parties, but this, this constituency. Here's the debate being screened. You know, as I say, it's a big event in these communities. We had, on average, I think, 250 people attending. Um, and and it was screened. The debate was usually in Creole. So most people, but not everyone, speaks Creole. So they also had, and that's not the language of either of the two main ethnicities. Um, it's the lingua franca from the, from the uh, capital. Uh, but then there was a translator. So you watched it once. And then you watched it again with, you know, pause, translation, pause, translation into local languages, of which there, there are many. Um, so what did we find? So I'm going to show you a series of these. And we asked lots of questions. And I'm just going to give you a, a sense of some of them. We put them into categories. So the first is about knowledge, knowledge about politics and candidates. And overall, if we average over all of them, there is a big significant effect. And I'm, but that's going to be in standard deviations. It won't be very much. So I'm going to show it to you in, in you know, actual percentage points, so you can see, you know, what it means. So this is, how many? Did you know the amount of the constituency facilitation fund? So this, the debate was held on average, three, like three or four weeks before the election, and then this data comes from exit polls. So on the day of the election or the day after, everyone was interviewed before the results came out. Um, so only 3% of people in control areas know the amount of this fund. 
the hand fees are given. So again, how do you hold them accountable if they don't know how much money it is? But in the treatment areas, and this is just, we've just randomly, we mapped the communities and then we randomly picked certain people to ask about how much they knew. So it's not even, they didn't even necessarily go to the debate, although most people in the village went to the debate. But, um, you know, it's just a random selection of people in that village. So nearly 18% of people know how much the constituency facilitation fund is in treatment areas. They know about the they know more about the candidates. What are they like? Like how much education are they? Which is the better educated candidate, for example? Are they the incumbent? I mean, in the control areas, people don't even know who the incumbent is. Right? So how can you hold someone accountable if you don't know which one is the incumbent? Um, they also learn about policy positions. So again, this is just examples. We ask lots of questions, but you know, they all follow this pattern. So what's the SLP? The candidate's first priority, are they keen on health or education? If you want to vote for someone who has the same priorities as you, you need to know what, what their priorities are, right? And you see, um, you see they know much more about the, what the candidate's priorities are. And also on these policy issues that were asked in the debate, like the free healthcare. Um, And critically, it changed how people voted. So here we have um, whether you are likely to be aligned with the, have the same policy preferences as the person you voted for. So if, if I care most about health, I, am I voting for the person who said that they cared most about health? So we see an increase um, in, the, in the percentage of people up to 52% from, from 43 to 52% of people who are voting for someone who has the same policy preference as them. So this seems to have helped get people voting on issues other than ethnicity. I mean, they're voting on, you know, they're thinking about policies. And critically, we get five percentage points more people voting for the person who's perceived as the winner of the debate. And we ask that by asking the audience at the end, who, who did you think was a winner? I mean, privately, not show of hands. Or uh, and we also had an expert panel who we had viewed them uh, with representatives from both parties or really more kind of meritocratic people who weren't necessarily aligned with the party. So you have five percentage points greater um, votes for the people, for the person who won. And that is, that is both in the exit poll and also in the actual voting data from the that the uh, National Election Commission uh, pr provided us with the data, polling center data. Um, so it actually, it wasn't just they were saying that to us, they actually really did vote more for that candidate. Now what is driving these results? We then did something, we took a few villages and showed people different bits, the different little clips of the debate, just try and figure out what it was that people were responding to. This is going to need a little bit of explanation. Some people in those villages just saw on the tablet, just watched the debate. It's obviously a very different experience than having 250 of your fellow community members, you know, and they were whooping and cheering during the debate. It's like it was a very participatory thing. But in these, in this, they're just watching it individual, it's just watching it on a little tablet. And then some people got that, but they only got the getting to know you. So in the US, people think, and a lot of what people get from the debate is just, oh, is this someone I'd like to have a beer with? So you might worry that, you know, you're changing how people vote, but it's just based on, oh, they're voting for the good looking person or the, you know, and then you think that, right, so we wanted to kind of see that, just give them anything, you know, something that would give them a sense of whether these people are, you know, charismatic or good looking or whatever. And, you know, had good hobbies or, um, and then the last group was, they just got a, just the facts, just straight somebody like a journalist just described the debate, but just the facts, they didn't get any of the charisma, they heard it, they didn't see anything, and it was just this person, you know, the SLP candidates have this many years of education, their priority issue is education, they, uh, the APC priority issue is roads, uh, etc. So, you know, any facts that came across, they were told 
in this radio summary. So it's not really what you would do if you were doing a radio program, it's just kind of boring facts. So then we look at the general political knowledge, and we see that general political knowledge goes up in all three groups. Even in the getting to know you, partly because what we found is when you survey people and you ask them about politics, you actually go out and talk to their neighbours more about politics, it's just the survey. So in order to screen that out, we also, we also interviewed a bunch of people only at the end, so we don't get these survey effects. So our results hold up even if we only look at people who we never surveyed during, just as an exit poll. So they didn't have a survey effect. So everyone increases the political knowledge. Everyone increases, in all these groups, candidate knowledge of candidate characteristics, like whether they're more educated and stuff. Only in the debates and the radio summary did they learn about policy stances. So the getting to know you kind of worked in that it told you about whether you like this person, but it didn't tell you anything about what policies they supported. So when it worked, I mean, it, like we wanted that to be the case because we wanted to be able to separate out the effects. But only watching the debate changed how people voted. So it's something about the combination of all those things that made people change how they voted. So again, policy alignment. If you watch the debate on your screen, you were more likely to vote for somebody who had the same policy priorities as you. And that was not at all the case in the other groups. Even though in this group you learned what their priority was, you somehow didn't change how you voted. And you also see this increase in voting for the candidate who performed best. It's not significantly different from this, but it is significantly different from the radio summary. So, and it's the same magnitude as what we find overall. So, I think, you know, what we're learning from this is there's something about seeing people, um, you know, seeing both their characteristics and the facts, just the facts on their own don't seem to sum up. It's about the engagement with the politician, it's not just about the facts. Um, and then this is what I'm most excited about, which is, we look, we went back, so the election is November, they take, they take office in January, and we go back a year and a bit later, so sort of February, no, February, March, uh, a, a year after they've taken office, and we ask the MPs um, what they spend their constituency facilitation fund from. So they get some money every year. What did you spend it on? Uh, we also track them. We have someone sitting in Parliament tracking. We get all the hands asked. We see if they spoke in Parliament, we see if they turned up to Parliament, we see if they were members of the committee in Parliament, so a whole bunch of measures of activity. There's no difference in the amount of activity. Um, all the, we also ask them what's your priority now to see if the people who you know publicly made a commitment of their priority in the election were more likely to be to stick with it because they made it public. No. Actually, people change their priority issues quite a bit. On, but in both people and control. However, those that were selected to be part of this program, to be part of the debates, had more constituency engagement. So they visited their constituency more often, they held more meetings when they were there, and we asked a bunch of different people in the communities. So this was done by survey teams going to these communities, meeting with a whole bunch of stakeholders, and saying, when was the NP last year? Um, and we tried to kind of triangulate to see if that was a real. But sometimes you get someone who's you know a supporter of the MP, and they're like, "Oh yeah, he's here every day." And like nobody else has seen the MP, and you're like, okay. "That was, that was not. He was not here actually." So we kind of triangulate from many different sources to get a sense of where they really are going. Um, and we also ask like clinic staff who tend not to be politically associated what they thought um, about whether the MP is doing a good job. Um, and so that goes up significantly for the ones who are part of the debates. And then really excitingly, so just to explain what we did. So they have this money to spend in their constituency. Nobody's cracking it. 
no actual even requirement for them to spend it in the constituency. They can spend it on their own travel or anything else. But we asked them how they spent it, and then we went to the ground to see if we could see physical evidence of those things happening. So if they said they built a bridge, we went to see if there was a bridge there. Sometimes the bridge had a sign saying, you know, built by Diffid. And you're like, okay, you, that wasn't your money that built this. And we asked the community, you know, do you know how much this costs? When was it built? Because maybe it was built five years ago. Right? So we verified all the expenditure. We, so we asked for receipts for things. So we then track how much of how much expenditure we can verify on the ground and compare it to the total constituency facilitation fund. So we can track 38% of, you know, of, it's not of constituency facilitation fund money, it's 38% of the value of constituency facilitation fund annual money. We can track that amount in control areas. We can find evidence of 94% of constituency facilitation fund budget um, on the ground in treatment communities. So there's a massive difference in how much actual physical stuff is happening in the communities of people who are part of the debate. Now, it's kind of a small sample. We're only looking at 14 uh, members of parliament out of, uh, of 28. But so I wouldn't hang my hat on it being exactly, you know, 56% different treatment effect, but it's big. Um, it's, it's really quite big and it's happening across the distribution. So there are, few, there are fewer MPs who are spending nothing, where we can track nothing, and there are also many more MPs who are spending you know, a lot and even above 100%. So, questions? <laughs> well, thank you, Rachel. 2012, and this is good that uh, she went uh, with the 2012 elections, and uh, I'm going to open it up to questions and reactions. But first, uh, let me say to you that uh, 2012, what is good about Sierra Leone in 2012 is the fact that it is probably one of the best-run elections in the country. 2007 and 2012, there is an improvement from 2007 to 2012. And the, the, the involvement of the youth in Sierra Leone at that point, the understanding that they had, made the election process a lot more, not only in a peaceful way, but also in a way where people voted um, alongside, should I say, their conscience? Because the youth were quite involved in the process, and I think they know what they are doing. Anyway. Um, Question, reaction. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much for this. And so, and this you. is, and I should say now, there's something that positive that Sierra Leone can be <laughs> can be associated with. I mean, many other good things too. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, my name is Kristen Mon with uh, the National Democratic Institute. Thanks for sharing these really interesting results. Um, I was just curious if, you know, through anecdotal evidence, if you have or if you have any ideas about whether there's a relationship between constituency engagement and the increase in, I guess, accountability or and who's using the funds in ways they're, they're meant to be. Is it giving ideas why that is? Just is it greater engagement with constituents or is it having been seen talking on television? I don't know if you have any thoughts or conjectures about that. Yeah, I mean, it is a conjecture because we can't, um, you know, with just 14, MPs, we can't say well, this kind of MP was we were, had more of an effect on this kind of MP than that MP because you know we just have to put them all in together in one group because it's only 14 out of 28. Um, I mean, you know, my sense is that it's going on record and seeing, um, you know, knowing that so many of your constituents saw this, uh, you know, saw you talking about how you were going to spend it, um, you know. It, Surely can't be a bad thing, and it's one potential route. Uh, how much it's because, you know, how linked it is that, that they went to visit the constituency more, I don't know. I don't know, but it's interesting that you get both. You get both the more uh, meetings and the more active um, participation, and also, uh, you know, the increase in spending. But I, 
there. It's, we were about to do a bunch of more work with trying to get, so when I presented the voting results in Sierra Leone, people got very excited and wanted to say, how can we do the, the engagement between elections and keep this going? And we were about to launch a bunch of things with the local um, CSO groups uh, that Vanessa was talking with, and then Ebola hit. I mean, literally, we were kind of, you know, talking about design, and that, you know, by the time I left, the emergency had been announced, and you know, nobody was allowed to travel. Hi, I'm Liz Lewis from the International Republican Institute. I was just curious, in your use of exit polling on the, the first set of findings, was there any attempt to capture how people who ended up not voting were affected by the debates? So everyone voted, basically. Okay. So in, I mean, this is we're, Yeah. So we're um, in in we were uh, interviewing people who lived in the main village where the polling station was, and turnout was ninety eight percent of the people were polled. So. Um, yeah, I mean, we were talking this morning about how a lot of efforts are to get people to vote, but like, yeah, everyone's voting, so you might as well be working on how do you vote. Um, actually, in the in the uh, I didn't show it, but in the in the individual randomized one in the bigger villages, voting turnout is a little bit lower, and you actually see an increase in turnout there, but it's still ninety three percent. So we can't really look at the people who don't vote because it's so small. I'm Wally, which is a male from Rome's recovery. And thank you for your great work. And I'd like to know what were some of your constraints and um, to this work and what's next? I want to talk about a bit about some of the constraints in this kind of environment. Um, yes, I, I mean, I'm happy to take it. Sure. I mean, I, I think I can mention some, and I think these are not just around constraints around doing this kind of evaluation. Obviously, you see there was a lot of data collected. Uh, but generally, constraints also are around logistics, moving people, having the right people at the right time, uh, making sure that you can organize all the activities um, in a, in a short period of time. And we just saw the same kind of constraints in Nigeria, where we had planned a series of events for an election date that then got pushed back, you know, two weeks. And so again, you know, how do we are um, both responsive and adaptive, but make sure that, that we, can, we can plan. Uh, I think that there was a lot of other activities. Um, so let me rephrase that. In any country, there's only a certain number of people who have uh, both uh, the ability and also the connections to mobilize and, and do certain activities. It's just limited. Uh, and so sometimes we have commitments to many donors. Uh, and so adding a, a new study or new set of activities already in our, in our work plan for a year means that we have to really think strategically and, and work with, with our strategic partners and see in each community how do we can get this off the ground. But um, time and time again, you just see enthusiasm, you know, and you see the resilience of everyone involved because, you know, they know in their hearts that this is the right thing to do uh, and that is useful. And I think that just having the data to present it allows us to make sure that the skeptics in the room can't turn away. You know, uh, and things that we have witnessed and whether we have qualitative information, now we have other kinds of data. And I think that for us, it's just really important to continue to add to the pool of evidence. And some of the findings today um, also validate many of the mixed methods evaluations that we have in other areas. For example, in DRC, we do a lot of mobile cinema. We also work in mobile cinema um, in the Sahel region. Um, so, so I think it's, it's good for us just to continue to add the, the pool. But I know you were there doing the data collection, and yeah. long days. Yeah, um, I mean, certainly doing elections kinds of projects as a researcher is both incredibly rewarding and, and in some sense is quite quick turnaround versus my agricultural work where you have to wait for the you know, rice to grow. And, <laughs> um, but it's, 
but I mean, the time pressure is just extraordinary. I mean, finding out who the MP candidates were at the end of September and running the debates and screening them, you know, in a matter of a few weeks was just extraordinary. And what I saw a bunch of other projects do is kind of wait until they knew, and then it was kind of too late. Um, whereas, whereas, and I said, what, what we done is we planned everything that you could plan, you know, that you didn't need that information for, so you were just ready to go when you got the critical, you know, buy-in of the MP or whatever. And I think that sort of advanced planning was was really critical. But I mean, there were extraordinary kind of logistical constraints in trying to screen things in, um, you know, in these very rural communities. But on the other hand, because they were very rural, there isn't much other entertainment. So the enthusiasm and, you know, the numbers of people who came was just extraordinary. So, you know, in, the, in that sense, the resource constraints were also a blessing because they didn't have any other information. So you really had a big impact. Um, what's next? What's next? Um, so it's sort of two directions. One, I think that I'd love to do more in terms of testing this more ongoing engagement, and are there ways um, to do more ongoing engagement between elections? Um, but also, uh, I'm very excited, as I say, not just about giving specific information, but kind of this more general engagement question. Um, but I also want to encourage people to do debates in other countries. I mean, we're going to try and go to Ghana. I don't know if anyone's working in Ghana. And, <laughs> uh, you know, talk to the groups there, show them these results, see if they can't get get organized to hold MP debates in the, in, in the election that's coming up. Um, and, you know, take this message to other countries. Obviously, it's going to be adapted. Like, we started off with, you know, what they've done in Benin, and, and we spent a lot of time with local groups saying, well, what, what makes sense? If you've got this general idea, but what makes sense in Sierra Leone? And we've got to... So people have got to adapt it locally, but there's clearly something going on here. Um, so, you know, it'd be great to try it somewhere else or try something equivalent, similar somewhere. So we should talk up with that. Uh, Agnieszka Paczynska, I'm at uh, George Mason University. Um, I'm curious, uh, was there a reason you decided to just focus on rural communities uh, as opposed to urban areas? Um, is an easy answer. And, and, and what do you, are you planning on seeing what the differences might be in terms of community responses? So the problem is with evaluation that you need to stop spillovers. So you want to, you, you know, you want to be able to treat this group and not that group. And Sierra Leone is great for that because they're miles away from each other. And, you know, there's, um, whereas if you do it in Freetown, you know, rural Sierra Leone is very bad. If you do it in Freetown, you have all these constituencies and it's very hard to say, well, this one's treatment and it's not having it. And if you showed it in one area, most of the people there might live and, you know, be voting somewhere else. So it's, if you were actually doing the program, it would be much easier to do it in urban areas. So I'd say next time, do the debates because we had, you know, you get many more people and it'd be much cheaper. Um, so it was really just an evaluation question. So if you're actually scaling up this program, I mean, I'm hoping, you know, next election season in Sierra Leone, we're going to have these debates for, you know, a lot of MPs and and hold big sessions in, you know, in Freetown and get lots of people. So it's not really the program at Sierra Leone. And then, sorry, did you have a second one? Yeah. Yes. Hi, Kirkwood Student Department of State. Thank you so much. This is fascinating. Um, my question is, what was it like combining the program and the research uh, aims for this effort, and were there tensions, and how did you negotiate those? Um, I believe there was already. This was I was not in my current position at that time. This was 2012. So, but um, what I gathered from the history is that Social Con Grant has been involved in elections and part of that system since 2008 and even before. So we were a very natural partner given our understanding of, of the context, given our understanding of elections and having the right partners to facilitate some of the surveying. For instance, you know, movement around election day or ability to have the data around exit polls or just be able to be present. 
So all those things need to be negotiated up front. And Search for Common Ground was already part of the planning process and had the partnerships there to facilitate this partnership. So for us, it was mostly just about making sure that we had the right and enough staff to make sure that we added a new set of activities at a very busy time uh, where projects were already taking place and ongoing. Uh, but this is something that we see time and time again across all our programs in Search for Common Ground. It's just well prepared just to adapt, be flexible, and, and strategize given given our knowledge of, of what's taking place in the country. So, I mean, I think absolutely key to this process is, you know, when we work like this, like we weren't a research team and a program team, we were a team. And uh, we, you know, we had, you know, I employed people full time on the ground, and they were, you know, running backwards and forwards to to search all the time. Um, you know, we it was it, we had a we had lots of conversations at the beginning about, you know, what should the program look like? What is it we're trying to test? Um, the country director for search, Ambrose James, had actually expressed a lot of interest in evaluation and. He'd come to a training program, so he knew about randomized evaluations um, and was really excited about doing a randomized evaluation. Um, and that it was really important. And then the team here in the headquarters was completely behind it. So I often say to researchers, you can't work unless you have buy-in locally and at headquarters. It has to be all the way down the organization. It's no good headquarters being in happy and the local team not like everyone has to want to do this because it is a ton of work um, and so yeah and just a, just a respect for what the other person knows and what they're bringing to the table is absolutely critical so you know we knew that we we didn't know all the questions should be in the debate we didn't know you know what the local issues were we weren't going to be able to moderate I mean none of this were our expertise and we had a great team that that if you see these, I should put some of them up online, but if you see these, they're, you know, they're nicely cut and like, you know, the production values are nicely, keep, you know, and you yeah. can see people getting into them. So all of that is, um, and yet we brought the expertise of like what should be in the questionnaire. So, you know, I think that that common respect for what the other person wants to do um, and starting early enough um, was the other thing. So, I mean, we tried to do something with the USAID around this election. And, it was just still too late in the day to like we're like no we need three months to figure it out we can't start talking in august like that's too late so i think you know having that dialogue and actually some of the members of my team kelly bigwell who's going to be here that um had worked as an intern in search yeah. <laughs> like years before yeah. so there was a really deep history of kind of and I've done the capes had relied on search for radio data for her thesis. So we've like worked together almost since 2004, not on a formal collaboration, but relying on each other's expertise. So I think that's, you need a deep level of trust to be able to do this kind of work. Yes, Philip Allen. Um, is the Sierra Leone Electoral Commission independent of government? And if so, is there a chance that it would take over the uh, sponsorship organization of debates and uh, evaluations uh, instead of having uh, us foreigners do it? So it's not so it's not us foreigners. Like the search team is all Sierra Leonean in Sierra Leone, um, yeah. including the country director Ambrose James. Um, so uh, and you know. And also, all the data collectors are all Sierra Leoneans. So there's no, um, you know, the research team of IPA is. Um, I mean, I guess there was there were a couple of foreigners, but all the enumerators were, and actually the the research assistant now is Sierra Leonean. Um, so, but in terms of so, NEC were very involved, and we brought them along, and they were very enthusiastic, and they made it possible because when they banned all public, all travel on the roads on election day, we thought, oh, our survey shot, but all, all the research team got were made uh, election monitors by NEC so that we could do this project. Um, I, don't, I don't think they want to take on the debates. They love these results. Um, I don't think they think they're the right people to do the debates. They're more about 
you know, making people sure people have the credentials and uh, there's no fraud. I don't think they want to get involved in, it, in running debates. Um, but, but you know, local media may, um, I don't know exactly who will take it on, but some of these, uh, these local community, um, uh, you know, CBOs or you know other local groups may may do it or it might be search again. I don't know. Yeah, I mean what I think is interesting about the evaluation is the evaluation tells us the debates that were done here in this cert and produced these results, but they don't tell us you know whether what role the facilitator played, uh, what time the debates were, you know how how early enough do we have to invite people to participate in the event. Do they need two, uh, two days notice so they can rearrange their household? Or do they need three days or a week, right? And so this is where we are going to be taking some of the findings here as well as pulling together a, a deeper layer of our, our other evaluation findings. So what do we know about our work that we evaluated in DRC around mobile cinema? And seeing whether there is uh, interesting qualitative and quantitative data that can give us a, a fuller picture. So I can't necessarily answer your question, and I don't think a single uh, report uh, can answer all the questions. I think that we just need to do more research and, and really understand what was so unique. Was it the involvement? Was the entertainment factor? Uh, and I think there's a lot of data just that we can put it together. But I, I do think that places that have been quite successful, civil society has taken on and uh, is really quite resilient and we've seen, for example, respiratory theater, which is another activity that Search for Common Ground does very widely, uh, all of a sudden uh, natural theater groups emerging and some of the people that we have trained and they've grown to, to have their own kind of engagement in, in some society. So I think that you see a natural growth of people that have been involved in some of the activities that then go on and do it themselves. Um, and we'd be here to support and I think Social Commerce Grant has always said that you know our, our role changes as the you know as the conflict or democracy changes as well. And so more and more we're seeing in some places we're taking a, a backstage and more supported, whether it's in Liberia or in other places. And so um, we'll we'll certainly see where our value added is and when it's no longer needed, you know, um, we might not be there anymore or be in a different capacity. To so answer your question whether the Electoral Commission is independent, oh, yes. in the books, they're independent. But I can tell you one thing, that uh, the recent um, commission, headed by Christian Ator, actually took us from the brink of serious chaos in that country. 2007 and 2012, that woman actually made the Electoral Commission independent. and. Whenever I talk about her, I become emotional because I was I was a commissioner in 1996 when the war was still on, um, and uh, we did things because it was a war. I'm not proud of some of those things that we did, but uh, Christiana Thorpe came out and actually saved Sierra Leone uh, back in 2007, and she did so again in two in 2012. So. Yes, but unfortunately, she has retired. Uh, now we have a new chair of the commission. Uh, the new chair of the commission grew up in the commission. I, somebody I know really well. I'm hoping that given what interference I'm seeing now with government, that they will not interfere because I know he would have a good, uh, decent way of trying to uh, make things happen the right way. But whether he'll be given the opportunity, or whether the commission will be given the opportunity to be independent like uh, uh, Madam Christiana Thorpe had been, I don't know. It's a wait and see. But again, pressure from all of you and encouraging Sierra Leoneans, because one of the things I have said over the years is that our leaders in Sierra Leone, and in fact in many parts of Africa, they thrive on our ignorance. And therefore, something like this, making people understand their their voting and their responsibility and their roles in society would only help. And of course, the politicians would not like that. But again, your pressure and talking to Sierra Leoneans, encouraging everybody to be mindful that the independence of the, of the Electoral Commission is very important, not only in Sierra Leone, but everywhere else in Africa. 
uh, I think I think that is one thing we cannot even uh, stress enough. One last. One. Yes. Uh, Alina from Partners for Democratic Change. Um, it sounds like your operations pretty much you know from the ground up. Um, so I'm wondering who you trained. Um, who were the ones actually up there gathering the data? Did you hire people who were already familiar with monitoring and the methodologies, or did you have to train them from for the start? research? For for the research side, for the data collection. Side. Data collection. Yeah, so as I said, I've been working in Sierra Leone since 2004. And um, so many of the team that were doing this work have worked through, you know, I started working with Statistics Sierra Leone, but now they only do national surveys. Um, so in a, and a number of researchers have come through and worked. And there's basically, you know, we've built up the team of, of Sierra Leoneans who are, you know, extremely good at doing very high quality data collection. Um, so that if this, you know, at this point is kind of a smooth operation, which is one of the reasons, for example, I don't know if you've seen the World Bank's work on the economic impacts of Ebola. Well, that was IPA who ran that. And the reason that they could do it was because while, you know, expats left, this research team was still on the ground. So these guys were, you know, phoning, doing phone surveys throughout the Ebola crisis. Um, and even have been data collecting out in the field, um, you know, in some areas. So it's it's a very impressive team of Sierra Leoneans, and they've kind of yeah. So some of my research assistants on this have worked as enumerators, and then they got trained and they moved up to supervisors, and now they're research assistants um, and you know running doing the analysis. So it's uh, it's one of the things I'm most proud of. <laughs> I mean, it's obviously not just me, like, um, but you know, a team of researchers have been working there. And if you keep working over the years, you you know, you give the opportunity for people to do survey after survey. They get very experienced, very good. Can I ask, where is the? Is this available to online somewhere? If you wanted to look at the research. Uh, yeah, I think they've got a link to the. the yeah. Research. So it's a working paper, as I said, that, you know, the results on, on the members of Parliament, um, you know, we literally ran those, that analysis, like, a, in the last week, <laughs> uh, the last couple of weeks. Um, so it's, it's, in economics, we sort of circulate working papers for a while and get a lot of feedback and hopefully they get better, so it may change a little bit, but um, I don't think it'll change that much. And then, it, and it's a research paper. so. Once we're absolutely sure that you know nothing's going to change in the results, if you know if our colleagues say, "Oh, you should have controlled for this or done that," um, we will bring out a more policy-oriented document. So at the moment, we've just got a we've got an academic paper, which is maybe a little academic, but we're we're going to work together to yeah. <laughs> to put together something that's more you know more policy-oriented, which I you know will I think start working on now. We we put together a, a summary of the paper that's a little. Um, easier to digest and we still get some of the charts there for people who are enthusiastic about standard deviation and p values and all that fun stuff that we learned in college so um but the, way the full paper will be under the Sierra Leone page at social well the academic paper as it stands right now and we'll continue to update uh people who have rsvp for this event People who are on our podcast and continue to share more findings as, as it goes forward. And um, I know Rachel has a blog, so I'm sure you can follow her blog, right? Uh, yeah, so uh, runningres.com is, um, is, is my website, and I'm so standing for running randomized evaluation, running RE's. Um, and yeah, I've actually blogged quite a bit about this project, so I'll be updating it on these. And last but not least, please still put a plug for Demony for Peace, which is a project that we host here at Search for Quinn Grand, which is around improving monitoring and evaluation capacity uh, for the peace building community, including the governance and democracy community, for us to not only educate ourselves more about methodologies, but also share key findings so that we grow this evidence of work and we're better positioned to um, have conversations with ourselves 
with our partners um, and, and grow the evidence of the work that we do. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, really, I, I should say thank you to Search for Common Ground and to Rachel for this uh, wonderful uh, piece. And uh, I thank you all for coming. And uh, again, uh, I represent an organization that is also good uh, in uh, this kind <laughs> of work. So if I can plug in that, uh, uh, that's Cambridge International uh, uh, that I work with right now. Uh, uh, we are hoping that we'll be having some very good work relations with such a common ground in this area. Uh, some of us have been in elections far too long. And, uh, uh, so I thank you very much for coming on, uh, on, on my colleagues' behalf. No, no, I'm fine, I should have. Yeah, absolutely. You have my contact, right? Oh, yes, I, I think I do. Because I